So our next guest now thinks the market is getting ahead of itself by counting on aggressive rate cuts. He sees more volatility ahead of that September meeting, and he's ready to deploy cash on the pullbacks in three areas in particular. So joining us now for more on that story is Matt Orton, the chief market strategist at Raymond James Financial. Uh, Matt, if you take a look at what we just heard from Jay with regard to the reasons why he thinks that the Fed needs to cut by a half, a half, a quarter, all by the end of December, it seems interesting that there is a divergent view strongly from your side about why exactly that should not happen. Why the view there? Yeah. Hey, Dom, great to see you. And I think, you know, two sides always make a market, right? And while I don't disagree with any of the points that he made with respect to where we are on the economy, when I look at the totality of the data to, to steal a term from, from Jay Powell, I just don't see a tremendous amount of weakness in the labor market that exists today. When I talk to corporate and management teams and travel around the country for client meetings, I just don't get the sense and I don't see mass layoffs that are actually going to come. When you look historically, you just don't see significant layoffs and big cracks opening up to be fissures in the labor market when you've got corporate profit margins on the S&P 500 at 12.2 percent, which is the highest we've had really since one quarter in, in 2021. So when you put all of that together, coupled with the fact that we're still seeing earnings growth, we still have a healthy corporate sector, the need for more than a 25 basis point cut, I just don't think is there. And then there's also the signaling that that has with respect to the rest of the economy and then potentially having other market participants ask, are we missing something in this? So I, I just don't think that there's a need to go more than 25 basis points. I think it's going to be part of a gradual cutting cycle, unless, of course, the data dictates otherwise. You know, Matt, it's interesting you bring that up because the number of traders and investors I've spoken to who talk about this idea that there is still decently robust earnings growth amidst this backdrop that at one point this summer, 59 percent of Americans say that we're in a recession it doesn't justify. It doesn't justify the kinds of valuations that we have. And I say this only because the Dow and the S&P are now just a stone's throw away from the record high levels that we saw just earlier this summer. How exactly then do things play out in the coming months, knowing that that's the setup going into the fall? So, you know, Dom, I get asked that a lot by our clients. And I was just at an event last night where we were talking about this. And the message that I give to our clients is that when you have valuations where they are and where the market is, is, is you know, priced to perfection in some parts of it, there's still a lot of the average stocks that have not participated in this rally so far this year. So mega caps, even though they have been weaker over the past month, month and a half, they've dominated a lot of the P.E. multiple expansion that we've seen, whereas your average stock on, you know, say the equal weighted S&P 500 it is still trading at average valuations over the past 20, 30 years. And that's where I'm looking for a lot of opportunity is where am I seeing a broadening of earnings growth finally starting to translate into price appreciation. And that's where you start to look for tangential plays on artificial intelligence, where you're seeing monetization of a lot of these themes and also maybe playing on misperceptions of a weak consumer because there's still pockets of strength. And it's all about being selective and leaning into those different themes where the stocks are not at all yet priced fully. OK, Matt, because you open the door, I'm going to walk through it. Let's take us through the picks, the sectors, the, the, the overall favorite ideas that you have, given that that set of context. So, Dom, I think you alluded to it earlier was I think one of the, the most important baskets I've been talking about is artificial intelligence 2.0. So a lot of the main plays in is your Microsoft of the world, uh, not to say that there isn't still value or still price appreciation potential there. But when you peel back the onion and look at where a lot of that CapEx from the hyperscalers is going to be spent, a lot of it's not just going to be spent in the semiconductor space. It's going to be spent on powering the data centers that are being built. It's actually on building the physical data centers. And, and it's on the wiring and all of the connectivity that actually makes it possible. So I've been looking a lot at electrical equipment companies, the companies that are providing the cooling solutions to the data centers. They've been strong performers this year. They've pulled back recently. So I think it's a great time to deploy more capital into some of those names. And when you look at actually some of the industrial names, maybe some machinery names that are actually building the data centers, there's a lot of earnings momentum that you're starting to see pick up in that part of the market too. And then you look at utilities. You know, 
actually bringing the power to the data centers is a huge, huge problem. There's just not enough of it. And so there's probably going to be trillions of dollars invested over the next three to five years in building out and modernizing our grid. So it's about finding the winners within that space uh, of who's actually going to be getting a lot of those federal and private dollars uh, to build out what we need to make AI a reality. All right. So the top picks there, Alphabet, Vertiv, Holdings, and Axon. Matt, thank you very much for the view there. A nice balance with what we've just heard uh, from Jay Bryson. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend.